Welcome to Season 2 of Insurgency Unmasked. Join us as we explore the hidden stories and complexities of the Ukrainian conflict and listen in as we deconstruct the war in Ukraine step by step, expert by expert. Today we're delving in to the historical context for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, from the beginnings of the Slavic world to the Soviet years. I'm truly honoured to announce a special guest for the opening episode of Season 2, a professor of Ukrainian and Soviet history at Oxford University, Spignev Wojnowski. Hello, Spignev. It's an honour to have you on. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I guess I, sh- I should call you Dr. Spignev Wojnowski, technically. Oh, just call me, just call me Zbig. <laughs> uh, with a Polish name like Zbigniew, I had to invent a shorthand for... <laughs> for English speakers I imagine so <laughs> so let's kick off today with how and why did you become a historian so I was always interested in history um, I think mostly because of my dad who is not a historian but he's an engineer um, with a real interest in history so history was always part of my childhood growing up just talking about especially modern and contemporary history and when I went to uni history was the obvious choice Um, when I was coming to the end of my bachelor's degree that was the time of the orange revolution in Ukraine and I was watching the news from Kiev um, with a keen interest and I realized that there was this huge country right next to mine I'm originally from Poland although I've lived in England since I was 15 um And I realized I knew nothing about it. Um, It was a country east of Poland, and I always just kind of thought it was all, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but when when I was much, much younger, I didn't really know about the differences between Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. And all of a sudden, there was this explosion of civic activism across the border in Ukraine. And I wanted to write my master's dissertation Um, about Ukrainian history just so that I would learn a little more about it and it just went from there I found it such a fascinating country Um, so culturally linguistically rich that when I started doing my master's research I decided I wanted to do a PhD uh, which was about Soviet period of Ukrainian history but very much with a focus on Soviet Ukraine um, and identity in Soviet Ukraine. What I what I wanted to understand was what it meant to be Ukrainian, what it meant to be Soviet, and how these two um, related to each other. Um, so that was the beginning. Only only whilst doing my my doctorate, I found out I actually had some Ukrainian roots. And my grandparents told me my my grandfather and my dad's dad told me that his mother was Ukrainian, and this was not something that they had ever mentioned before. Because in that generation, there was a lot of Polish-Ukrainian animosity. Um, and um, so, so I discovered I had this, this whole Ukrainian family uh, in Western Ukraine I had never heard of. But that wasn't really the deciding factor. It was just a bonus. Mm. Yeah. It's a fascinating little journey into the world of academia, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I had this <laughs> urge to... Once I, once I knew more about Ukraine myself, I wanted people in the UK or in the sort of English-speaking academia to know that there was this really interesting and, and really important country um, that we don't know so much about, but which was at the center of all the major conflicts in the 20th century. Um, World War I, the Ukrainian territories were contested. World War II, Ukraine was right at the center of Hitler's plan for Lebensraum. Um, The collapse of the Soviet Union would not have happened without uh, Ukrainian input. So it's it's just so central to European history and and it's so peripheral to um, our knowledge of European history that I thought there was something I could do that would be worthwhile, um, sort of not only academically, but also in terms of understanding modern politics, I suppose. Um, look, this is where history is going to play out. 
Uh, I that that was that was my instinct. Um, and it's playing out in a different way to what I had hoped for or what I had anticipated, frankly. Um, but it is clearly where European history is being made now. I was I was about to say, unfortunately, you're proved right once again. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not maybe. So I didn't I didn't want to sound uh, mm, big headed. I didn't I did not see this war coming. Uh, yeah. That's not what I'm saying. I just thought that there was a lot to find out about this territory, um, and I thought I could contribute to it. I completely agree. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that even two days before the invasion, I was saying it's not going to happen. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think a lot yeah. of people were sold on kind of misfortunes and disbelief, but it happens. Two days before the invasion, I thought it would happen. But let's say three months before the invasion, I didn't think it would. Mm. Um, after Putin made that infamous televised speech, a few days before the full-scale invasion in February 2022, when he basically made a rambling, historical, interestingly, historical uh, lecture about how Ukraine is really Russia, um, how Ukraine has always been part of Russian history and soul. I thought, okay, this is basically a declaration of war. Um, but before that, I was hesitant to make any predictions either way, really. Yeah. So let's start with what's a Slav? To a complete beginner that might have they've seen a bit of news about Ukraine or probably a lot of news about Ukraine in the last year and don't really know the history. What where does it all kind of begin? <laughs> so Slavs are a linguistic group. Slavs are people who speak Slavic languages, uh, which are a subgroup of the Indo-European family of languages. So Broadly speaking, there are three subdivisions of Slavic languages. There are the Western Slavic languages like Polish, Czech, and Slovak, the Southern Slav, Slav languages like Serbian, Croatian, Bulgarian, and then the East Slavic languages like uh, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian. Hmm. Um, you, you could, you could, you could, you could ask what a Rom, what Romans, Romans people are, right? People. Who speak Romance languages like French, Italian, and Spanish, or Portuguese, or Romanian. Um, it's the same kind of concept that's based on language. Slavs don't mm. share a religion, they don't really share a common history of statehood, um, but they share a um, family of languages. It is striking that we, we have a term for Slavs in a way that we don't have a name for people who speak Germanic languages. We somehow don't throw uh germans and english speakers into one into one basket so that designation of slav this sort of it's like obsession with the fact that people speak similar although not mutually intelligible languages the fact that this leads us to then describe them as somehow one um cultural group that's 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 an outcome of of politics um it's like orientalization of eastern europe maybe definitely a legacy of Russian imperial rule where the Russians in the 19th century uh, promoted ideas of pan-Slavism, claiming the right to protect fellow Slavs across borders and claiming that because people spoke similar languages, they should have some kind of a common political structure. That idea was used to justify Russian imperial rule and Russian imperial expansion. Mm -hmm. So Slav is a linguistic term but also it has all these political, very problematic political connotations. Yeah. Does that make I, sense? Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, uh, that's a brilliant explanation of it. Um, so obviously we're going to be focusing on Ukraine and Russia, and I guess to a lesser extent Belarus as well, because they're always involved somehow. Um, so how have these kind of the ties between these countries influenced each other's histories? <laughs> well, that's a huge question. Um, I should so what what distinguishes um, the East Slavs, let's call them that, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians. I use that term very cautiously. 
uh, from, let's say, the Western Slavs, like Poles and Czechs, is religion. Um, um, the um, medieval state of Kiev and Rus adopted Orthodox Christianity as their state religion. It covered most of the territories of what is today Ukraine and Belarus and parts of what is today European Russia. And it created a common, um, common religious sort of framework for, 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 for these countries. Um, but okay, I, I'm not really sure where to start with sort of links, links between them. Let me think about a useful way of answering your question. Mm, let's, let's, let's focus on Ukraine, maybe. Maybe it will be easier rather than speaking yeah. about all three. Um, up until the mid 17th century, um, most of what is today Ukraine, was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And um, along the river Dnipro, uh, so basically in central Ukraine, um, a new community emerged by the mid 1600s, the Cossacks, the Zaporizhian Cossacks, who were basically a social group that provided military services to the Polish-Lithuanian monarchs in return for certain freedoms. And in the 17th century, they rebelled against the Polish king because he refused to give them the kinds of political autonomy that they wanted. And as part of that, of that rebellion, they uh, reached an agreement with the Russian czars, um, the, the Treaty of Pereyaslav signed in 1654, which um, resulted in the incorporation of Kiev and territories uh, east of Kiev into the Russian uh, into the Russian state. The Russian Tsars promised to maintain an autonomy for these regions, so they basically promised to um, treat these territories as legally, politically distinct from Russia proper, but by the beginning of the 18th century these promises had been uh, betrayed and um, right, sorry, uh, left bank Ukraine, so territories east of the Dnipro River were incorporated into the Russian Empire. Later, in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, most of the territories west of the Dnipro River were also incorporated into the uh, Russian Empire, um, with the exception of what is today Western Ukraine, regions of Galicia, for instance, uh, which became part of the uh, Habsburg Empire. So the city of Lviv was not part of Russia, was not never ruled from St. Petersburg or Moscow until uh, 1939, until the Nazi-Soviet pact. Mm. And this um, incorporation of what is of most of what is today Ukraine into the Russian Empire by the uh, late 18th century resulted, of course, in the Russification of um, um, most of Ukraine, but also, ironically, in the 19th century, in the age of nation building, led to the creation of modern day Russian and Ukrainian identities. A question I'm often asked at I don't know, dinner parties is, are Ukrainians a real nation? Are Ukrainians a real nation? And the short answer to that is yes, they are a real nation. They, they have a distinct identity, and we see that manifest itself in the Ukrainian resistance to the full-scale Russian aggression. But like any nation, uh, Ukrainian national identity had to be imagined, had to be created at some point. And like most nations in Europe, that identity was created or imagined, delineated in the 19th century. There's an excellent book by uh, the historian Faith Hillis, who describes that process. The book is called Children of Rus, the Children of Rus. And Faith Hillis argues that the incorporation of most of what is today Ukraine into the Russian Empire um, resulted in a sort of nation building process in the mid 19th century. She argues that both Russian and Ukrainian identities emerged in territories around the city of Kiev um, from the 1830s onwards. So those territories were um, predominantly inhabited by 
Orthodox peoples, uh, people that we could cautiously call East Slavs, but economically they were dominated by the Polish nobility, and they also had uh, large Jewish communities. And because the Polish national movement posed a major challenge to the Russian Empire uh, following the partitions of Poland in the late 1700s, um, the Russian czars were quite keen to weaken the influence of the Poles um, in and around the region of Kiev. So from the 1840s onwards, they were basically sponsoring a project that would um, give the Orthodox peoples in those territories a separate identity that would be defined against the Poles and the Jews. So this is what the Russian czars were doing. They called the Orthodox population around Kiev little Russians at this point. And um, there were people in those territories who were quite keen um, to participate in creating this little Russian identity that would be distinct from the Poles and the Jews and that would allow the local Orthodox peoples to mobilize um, as a community. But this little Russian project very quickly split into two branches. Um, so some of its activists claimed that in order to weaken the Polish and the Jewish influence in um, the region around Kiev, they need a strong state behind them. They need the czar because the Polish gentry especially is especially is very economically dominant and without the czar's support the orthodox population around kiev are not going to be able to protect their rights so members of the orthodox clergy orthodox intelligentsia some orthodox christian noblemen rallied behind this um nation building project and they started to call themselves russian they, they started to identify with the russian state uh, that could protect them against the non-Orthodox peoples of this area. But other um, intel intellectuals, especially emerging from this uh, Little Russian project, began to argue that most of the Orthodox population were peasants. And most of the peasants uh, were, were mistreated by the Russian, by the Russian state. Uh, before the emancipation of the serfs in the 1860s, but even after the emancipation of the serfs in the 1860s. So they began to argue that it was not only the Polish gentry or the Jewish population who were a threat to the local Orthodox peoples. They also began to say that the Tsar and the Tsarist state were equally damaging for the Orthodox peoples of this territory around Kiev. And these people began to call themselves Ukrainian eventually. So from this attempt to distinguish the Orthodox population of the Western or Southwestern borderlands of the Russian Empire from the non-Orthodox peoples arose two nation building projects, Russian and Ukrainian. And this is really, if, if we limit ourselves to only modern history, this is where um, the conflict between the Russian and the Ukrainian identities begins, right? The Ukrainians are suspicious of a strong centralized czarist state, whereas the Russians um, see that state as necessary for their survival. It's, I think, nation building slash uh, kind of developing that cultural identity is quite a dangerous path, or it is filled with dangerous paths, I should say. <laughs> Yes, of course. But this was the this was the thing in the 19th century. Everyone was doing it. It was the way to organize a community. It was it wasn't it wasn't these were not projects that were um, irrational. These were not projects that were divorced from the sort of economic or political realities. Mm -hmm. They were projects that at their hearts were supposed to mobilize the population um, so that they could um, protect their political and economic rights. And this is this is an age where we begin to question the divine right to rule, where we begin to um, question religious justifications for political power, and the nation becomes the um, sort of sovereign community which claims the right to hold its leaders accountable to itself and not to God. Um, so 
but 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 yes, these these nation building projects just take very um, very um, winding pathways, and the people who launch these projects often do not necessarily like where they go. Um, of course, with the emergence of the Ukrainian movement, which questions the czarist rule over Ukraine, the, the Russian czars begin to crush that movement. They in, impose bans on publications in the Ukrainian language. Um, and they persecute activists of the Ukrainian national movement. But at this point, what matters is that parts of what is today Ukraine are not under the czar's control. So the city of Lviv becomes an important cultural center where some of these ideas about Ukrainianness as a distinct identity separate from Russia can develop more freely because under the Habsburg Empire, there is more room uh, to cultivate um, diverse ethnic or national identities. Mm. So there is a lively exchange between the Habsburg Empire and the Russian Empire, among the intellectuals from both empires, which allows this Ukrainian national idea to develop further, despite the Tsar's attempts to crack down on it. Mm. Even you say about uh, Lviv, uh, even the architecture, if you say compare there to uh, Kharkiv, two very different looks of a city. Absolutely, yeah. Lviv has this baroque old town center and then a very 19th century Habsburg. Um, I mean, they're not really suburbs anymore, but uh, the, the, the parts of the uh, se parts of central V developed under under the Habsburgs, they definitely have a different vibe <laughs> to what you would see in formerly Russian imperial towns and cities. Certainly. And then what effects does two socialist communist revolutions have on these nation building projects? Yeah, well, <laughs> so the the Ukrainian the Ukrainian nation building project I've just spoken about it culminates in attempts to establish uh, an independent Ukrainian state um, in 1917 and 1918. The Ukraine that exists for quite a short time um, and is then crushed by the Red Army is a revolutionary state. Right? It, it, it emerges because the Russian Empire collapses, but its leaders are socialists. They are, um, I suppose we could say, non-Marxist socialists. They share uh, with other revolutionary forces in the former Russian Empire the idea that things cannot continue as they have been, um, but they have a very different vision of modernity and progress to the one which the Bolsheviks are pursuing in Russia. So for most of the Ukra most of the revolutionaries who establish an independent Ukrainian state, um, the key to um, progress is empowering the um, peasant communities, whereas the Bolsheviks are really claiming that it's the proletariat who are the future of mankind. The Ukrainian activists want to give more political and more economic rights to the peasantry. Mm. Um, Lester is such an interesting uh, person. So Nestor Machno, uh, he doesn't quite fit what I'm talking about because he was he was an anarchist. He didn't really mm. his his ideas about the importance of nationhood. I think um, differed from the people who established the Central Rada, the Central Council mm. in uh, Kiev, uh, for whom the nation was the foundation of this yeah. new entity of this new revolutionary entity that they wanted to create. But Makhno is a good example in showing that Ukraine was always home to very diverse political and revolutionary forces, which clashed, of course. But this clash also meant that um, the self-proclaimed righteousness of any one ideology was always questioned. Um, any attempt to establish a single truth, any attempt to establish 
a, a sort of teleological view of progress. This is the way that history goes. Um, we're always subject to scrutiny because Ukraine was um, politically diverse and politically divided. But what I was going to say is that these, these attempts to um, establish a Ukrainian state following the collapse of the Russian Empire are led by revolutionaries, non-Marxist socialists, um, who want to redistribute land amongst the peasantry, who are calling for um, a more democratic political system with, a, with an elected parliament. Um, so very different revolutionary visions to the ones that are being promoted by the Bolsheviks in Petrograd, or later in Moscow, and um, because the Bolsheviks, of course, want to industrialize as quickly as possible, they proclaim that there is a need for a dictatorship of the proletariat, so the revolution, in order to survive, has to be, for an unspecified period, uh, a dictatorship that will fight against counter-revolutionary forces and enlighten the backward population, basically tell them what's good for them uh, before a sort of communist paradise can be created, the Ukrainians, do not, the Ukrainian revolutionaries in Kiev, do not share that vision, but their short-lived uh, state is destroyed by the Red Army. But then, in the 1920s and up until collectivization of agriculture, um, up until the time when Stalin really consolidates power, the Bolsheviks come to a sort of uneasy compromise with the Ukrainian national activists. So they create among other republics, uh, Soviet Ukraine, which has clearly delineated borders, which has a capital city, which at first is in Kharkiv and then in the mid thirties moves to Kiev. Um, Kiev is seen as too closely associated with that Ukrainian independence movement of 1917, 1918. Um, but anyway, the Bolsheviks create um, a Ukrainian entity with borders with a capital city with its own at least in theory autonomous um, part of the bolshevik party with its own ministries of education or um, agriculture uh, basically with its own government and the 1920s are a time when Ukrainian language, Ukrainian literature, um, Ukrainian uh, institutions can flourish. There is a book by Mehl Fowler, which I would recommend, it's called Beaumont on the Empire's Edge, which describes the vibrant atmosphere, the vibrant intellectual political movements in Soviet Ukrainian Kharkiv in the 1920s. She shows that there are um, political activists, cultural activists, some of whom had participated in the attempt to create an independent Ukraine uh, in the late 1910s, some of whom are members of the Bolshevik party, but all of whom share a vision for Ukraine as a separate entity from Russia. Right? So even the Ukrainian Bolsheviks are different from the Russian Bolsheviks in the 1920s. They um, see Ukraine as part of a broader revolutionary Europe um, in which Russia is a part, of course, but it's not the central part. They do not view Moscow as the mecca of the socialist revolution. And instead, they develop their own ideas about what revolutionary progress in Ukraine should look like. And they believe that Ukraine should have genuine, not just theoretical autonomy. They also create some wonderful works of literature um, as part of the Soviet policy of karenizatia or indigenization. So the Bolshevik, the central Bolshevik authorities in Moscow basically allow them some leeway to develop ideas about what it means to be Ukrainian and how that fits in with the socialist revolution. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but how 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 does this nation building movement um, interact with two revolutions in 1917 with imperial collapse well i think that the collapse of the of the russian empire in revolutions culminates in attempts to create a ukrainian state and when these attempts fail um for about 10 years 
we see an attempt to define a special role for Ukraine in the socialist future of mankind. Mm. I just wanted to emphasize that these, um, the Ukrainian nation building movement in the form that it had acquired since the mid 19th century mm. and in the form that still informed dynamics in Soviet Ukraine in the 1920s, this Ukrainian identity, this Ukrainian nation building project is destroyed completely in the early 1930s. Perfect. Yeah, that's a fantastic summarization. Yeah. The modern insurgent is completely independent. If you want to support our work and help boost independent journalism, please consider supporting us via Patreon at patreon.com slash modern insurgent. Thank you very much. I'll just bang that on hold quickly. Have you seen the news that's potentially breaking yeah. right now? About Prigozhin? Yeah. Yeah. Very mad. Yeah. If anyone, it's... obviously, it's not, we'll be releasing this at some point in the future, but as we've been filming this, there's reports coming out of a plane crash going from Moscow to St. Petersburg um, and potentially Prigozhin's on there. Or Prigozhin, uh, Prigozhin was, Prigozhin was on, on the, on the what, what's it called? Passenger Manifesto on the, on the list of passengers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting times for all the wrong reasons, I guess. Um, I, I will, I've just, I've literally just seen the news. So yeah. I'm not yet sure what to think of it. <laughs> it, it it seems like there was two planes and he could potentially be on the other one, but it seems like it's all kind of going down as we speak right now. So it'll be interesting for the future when this is released. I imagine we'll know a lot more. Yes, let's, let's hope so. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, where were we? 1930s. I was saying that the Ukrainian national movement in the form that it had acquired since the 1830s, the 1840s, in the form that fueled attempts to create an independent Ukrainian state in the late 1910s, in the form which still existed in the 1920s, in the early years of Soviet rule, that Ukrainian national movement, that kind of Ukrainian national identity was totally destroyed in the early 1930s. And this was associated with the massive famine, and uh, so-called Holodomor, which killed several million uh, Ukrainians. Estimates vary, but the historian Timothy Snyder gives a figure around, I think I'm right, around 4 million, um, 4 million victims of the famine in Ukraine alone. And this was a famine which uh, really broke the Ukrainian peasantry, the Ukrainian peasantry, which had been the backbone of the Ukrainian national movement since the 19th century. It was a famine which went hand in hand with a wholesale attack uh, on Ukrainian institutions. Um, for example, the Ukrainian Autonomous Orthodox Church, which had existed in the 1920s, was now um, liquidated and incorporated into the Russian Orthodox Church. Poets, writers, historians, political activists who had been active on the Ukrainian scene in the 1920s, including members of the Bolshevik party, were now purged, arrested and killed. Some very prominent figures like the poet Mykola Khvilovy created some of the most wonderful Ukrainian poetry, uh, committed suicide uh, amidst this attack on the Ukrainian intelligentsia. Now the famine, um, the history of the famine is um, controversial and still, um, despite there being quite a few very rich, very convincing historical works, it's still a field that needs further research. Uh, what I think is beyond question is that Ukraine was always, um, throughout the 20th century, but also before, an important source of food. Um, the Ukrainian... Um, states which existed in um, well, after the collapse of the Russian Empire were able to survive largely because of the support they got from Germany, 
uh, at the end of World War I, uh, when Germany was defeated in November 1918, their fate was more or less sealed. That's when the Bolsheviks were able to reconquer most of Ukraine. Um, during World War II, Ukraine was central to Hitler's plans for Lebensraum, for, for giving Germany food security, food independence. <clears throat> but in the early 1930s, Ukraine was really central to Stalin's plans to essentially squeeze the peasantry, to exploit the peasantry for all they could produce, um, to get as much grain from the peasants as possible in order to uh, fuel the USSR's industrialization drive. So the, the, the grain that was confiscated from the peasants was used to feed the expanding cities, but it was also used for export. Even at the height of the famine, when millions of people were uh, dying, uh, the USSR continued to export grain um, in return for um, hard currency, in, in return for machinery that could um, support the sort of breakneck industrialization which Stalin set to pursue. Now, so this, this is all uncontroversial. This is, I think, pretty, pretty well established. Um, that Stalin was aware of the scale of the famine is also quite clear. Uh, we have telegrams which he personally signed um, corresponding with Soviet leaders in Ukraine, but also in, in Kazakhstan, which also went through a massive famine in the early 1930s, where it is quite clear uh, that he was informed about the scale of starvation and, and, and death. Now, some historians emphasize that for Stalin, the deaths of millions of peasants or nomads in the Kazakh case were just collateral damage that he knew it was happening, but he was quite prepared to let it continue because he was determined to industrialize the USSR. But other historians claim, and I would argue quite convincingly, that there was a strong ethnic element to the famine as well. Uh, Timothy Snyder, in his very widely cited, widely read book, uh, Bloodlands, uh, argues that Stalin saw Ukrainian peasants as enemies. He saw Ukrainian peasants, but also the Ukrainian intelligentsia, as disloyal to um, the centralized Soviet state. Partly because Ukraine had much longer, much more established traditions of individual land ownership, as opposed to collective land ownership in the Russian heartlands of the USSR. But also because um, Stalin suspected um, Ukrainians, self-identified Ukrainians, or people who he identified as Ukrainians, of um, espionage, of potentially allying with neighboring Poland. Um, he was very suspicious of the fact that Ukraine was so close to the USSR's borders. So he basically believed that um, the um, inhabitants of Ukraine or Ukrainians in Ukraine were less loyal than the Russians in the Russian heartlands of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And Snyder argues in his book that Stalin was not only prepared to let the peasants starve as collateral damage, but that he saw the starvation of millions of Ukrainians as a um, goal in his own right. That this, this was a way of undermining any potential um, opposition to his quote-unquote project of modernization. Even when it was quite clear that Polish um, espionage networks in Soviet Ukraine were dysfunctional, that they had been destroyed. Stalin was extremely suspicious of Ukraine breaking away from the, from the Soviet Union. Grain requisitioning quotas in Ukraine were higher than in most of the USSR. Um, Ukraine's borders during the famine were sealed so that Ukrainians were prevented from escaping the famine into Russia, Belarus, or Georgia across the Black Sea. Ukraine and Kazakhstan had by far the worst um, famines out of the entire Soviet countryside. The south of Russia, also notably inhabited by very large Ukrainian communities, had similarly um, devastating famine rates in the early 1930s.
As I've already mentioned, the famine went hand in hand with attacking institutions in Ukrainian cities, institutions that have cultivated a sense of Ukrainianness. And the outcomes of the famine were basically the destruction of the Ukrainian national, national movement. Mm -hmm. um, houses that had been emptied uh, after people stopped were now repopulated with new arrivals from further inland, from Russian parts of the Soviet Union. Masses of Ukrainian orphans grew up in Russian-speaking orphanages. So the outcome of the famine was effectively the Russification of Ukraine. Um, and that was the end of this Ukrainian national movement that we saw um, over the previous, give or take, 100 years. But Ukrainian identities, the Ukrainian Republic, and the, even the Ukrainian language did not disappear from the Soviet Union. They were now redefined. Whereas in the 19th and the early 20th century, Ukrainianness was defined in opposition to both the local Polish gentry, which was economically dominant, but also the Russian state. From the mid 1930s onwards, narratives, state sponsored narratives of what it meant to be Ukrainian, emphasized that Ukrainians were Russians' younger brothers who had always faced. Um, hostile neighbors from the West and who had relied on the Russians to protect them against the Germans, the Poles, the Hungarians, as well as various ethnic minorities at home. So for instance, there was a, in the Soviet narratives of Ukrainian, there was a fairly clear anti-Semitic strand, for instance, that uh, basically claimed that non-Ukrainians in Ukraine were disloyal were a threat to the Ukrainian majority, which the Russians helped Ukrainians protect themselves from. Um, and you see that kind of narrative of Ukrainianness really continue in Soviet public culture and history textbooks, um, various anniversary celebrations up until the 1980s. If you look at um, history textbooks from the 1970s, which children used at school, um, you have this very essentialist, almost racialized idea of what it means to be Russian and Ukrainian. So children would learn about how the, and I quote, tall, beautiful East Slavs um, fought against a whole host of external enemies. Uh, mm -hmm. so just to add on uh, to the kind of Holodomor aspect, I remember going to the museum in central Kiev uh, when I was mm -hmm. last there and just a gut wrenching experience, like the photos and kind of like the source documents that you see there. Are, it's tough. It was absolutely awful. I mean, th that's an understatement. Um, um, the figures saying that several million people starved, it doesn't really do justice to the suffering of individual families, the um, sheer horror of uh, seeing entire villages starve, um, spread of cannibalism. Um, it was um, a crime against humanity which is diff maybe difficult, it's difficult to appreciate the scale of that tragedy by just looking at the sort of high level, high level politics of the famine or just the statistics. Um, yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more. I kind of any, mm -hmm. any good museum like that always leaves a lasting impression. And it's the one in Kiev is certainly one of the yeah. biggest for that, to be honest up there with some of the genocide museums in Bosnia and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just um, the centrality of food in Ukrainian history is something that we still see the legacies of today. I mean, with Ukraine, with Ukrainian um, farmers not being able to export their grain, you see the threat of famine raising its ugly head in parts of Africa and elsewhere. Yeah. It's, it's um, definitely swayed the politics of 
more nations than I can count on one hand over which side they're supporting, over which side they were buying wheat from. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, it is, I know it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a stock phrase, but Ukraine has been and continues to be the breadbasket <laughs> yeah. of not just Europe, but the world, really. Yeah, 100%. So what I, yeah, what I wanted to emphasize is that the, the, the Soviet state, following the famine, redefines Ukrainian identity in a way which supports close ties to Russia, mm. which defines all Eastern Slavs as one big family. And they use the family metaphor a lot. Also friendship. I mean, the, the word friendship in the Soviet Union is loaded. Um, and... I know it sounds like a nice concept, um, but it's 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 a very abusive friendship to say the least. Um, and you know the, the the Soviet propaganda machine really knows how to appeal to emotions. Ukrainians, as the Russians' younger brothers, Ukrainians, and other peoples of the USSR living in um, friendship. Um, these are attempts to channel inter-ethnic relations in such a way that relies on emotion rather than um, any kind of rational debate about the history or politics of inter-ethnic relations in the region. And it continues up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, and we see the legacies of this kind of narrative today. When Putin says, when Putin says in that televised speech that Ukrainians and Russians are one people, effectively, that Ukrainians have always relied on their older brothers, um, when he mobilizes this notion of East Slavdom, you began by asking about who, who the Slavs are. Mm. Um, for Putin, that concept of Slavdom is central to his definitely what he says but maybe also what he thinks i'm speculating here um but it was in 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 the soviet period that the belarusians the ukrainians and the russians were defined as one east slavic group with subdivisions into belarusians ukrainians and russians and when putin went to school in the 1960s this is what he would have learned right he would have learned that ukrainians belarusians and russians are basically one uh, that they had always been one, that they need to stick together because they face external threats. Um, and like many men in their late 60s, early 70s, he might well think that what he learned at school was right, and any attempt to question that is political correctness gone mad. Um, he wouldn't might be well the only be... one, would he? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, he might well think that Ukrainian attempts to be genuinely independent from Russia are somehow unnatural. Mm. Because what's also really distinct about the Soviet narratives, post-1930s narratives of nationhood, is that they're very primordial, by which I mean nations in Soviet narratives, nations in Soviet press, in Soviet history textbook, nations were portrayed as these natural, fixed, ancient communities that had always been there mm. and would always remain. And they, they and they would remain in the shape that they existed since times immemorial. That phrase, since times immemorial, is something that Putin evoked in his speech before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, by the way. Mm. Um, so the Soviet state, in a sense, hijacked the Ukrainian nation-building project for its own purposes following the following the famine um, it leads me on almost perfectly to my next question because it's almost the end all the be all and end all of putin's kind of historical narrative is it's the great patriotic war it yes. everything kind of comes back to i mean in russia it's called the great patriotic war other people might know it as world war ii if anyone doesn't know but how how important is that to this narrative? It's very important. So what the Soviets and what, what the Soviets call the Great Patriotic War and what Putin continues to call the Great Patriotic War is slightly different from World War II in that um, the chronologies are different. 
The Great Patriotic War in the Russian narrative began in 1941 and ended with the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany in 1945. This quite conveniently bypasses the years 1939 to 1941 when the USSR and Nazi Germany were allies <laughs> uh, and they partitioned um, um, large parts of East Central Europe. The Great Patriotic War in the narrative, in the sort of in Putin's narrative of eternal Russo-Ukrainian friendship, um, which needs to be maintained at all costs, is central um, because it is the prime example of how the Russians and Ukrainians fought hand in hand against external enemies, against the Nazis. Um, it is part of a broader history. So in the Soviet Union, um, the, the, the Cossack uprisings of the 1640s and 1650s, um, the um, Ukrainian struggle against Polish domination in the 19th century were part of the same story, which culminated in the Ukrainians and the Russians fighting against the biggest enemy of all in the 20th century, Nazi Germany. In the, so in the Soviet narrative about the Second World War or about the Great Patriotic War, the Russians were the first among equals. The Russians were celebrated as the people who united the other peoples of the USSR around themselves in order to defeat Nazi Germany. The fact that Ukrainians and Belarusians um, played a very important role in that victory that it was Ukraine and Belarus primarily that were occupied by Nazi Germany, and this was an extremely brutal occupation. Um, that was not part of the official narrative. Um, the fact that the Jewish population suffered disproportionately, to say the least, that they were targeted in the Holocaust, that most of them were murdered, that was not part of the official Soviet narrative either. The Holocaust was taboo in the USSR. There was this doctrine of equality in suffering, but also Russian primacy in leading the Soviet peoples towards victory. So in that sense, Soviet and post-Soviet Russian histories of World War II are used to justify Russian um, imperial control over the former Soviet republics. Because the idea is that because the Russians defeated the Nazis, or in, in Russian they usually don't use the word Nazis, they say the fascists. Um, that absolves Russia of any responsibility for the wars that they might have launched. The Russians cannot be the bad guys because they defeated the fascists, right? Well, the history of World War II is really central to both fueling fears of external influences, external threats to um, the Slavic world, let's say. It is central to supporting the idea of Russo-Ukrainian friendship, and it is central to whitewashing anything that Russia might have done or might still do. But of course, what complicates the history of World War II is that um, there were also Ukrainians who resisted the Soviets in World War II. And um, this, the history of far-right Ukrainian resistance, of Ukrainian fascist resistance to the Soviets is the most well-known example of how Ukrainians resisted the Soviet state's attempt to hijack their identity. And this is the part of Ukrainian history which Putin likes to trumpet today as well. Um, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or the OUN, and its military wing, the uh, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, or the UPA, um, had their origins in interwar Poland. So parts of Western Ukraine, including the region of Galicia with the capital in Lviv, but also the region of Volhynia, um, did not end up in the USSR after World War I, but they ended up in Poland. Ukrainian activists at Versailles had hoped that um, the victorious powers would allow for the creation of an independent Ukraine, but that was not to be. And Ukrainian responses to being incorporated into 
interwar Poland vary. On the left, there were Ukrainian communists who looked at Soviet Ukraine as an example of a kind of proto-state which they could join and, and where, they, where they could pursue their political and cultural agenda more freely than Poland allowed for. But these Ukrainian communists were first of all discredited by the massive famine of the early 30s. And secondly, they were purged by Stalin himself. Stalin destroyed the so-called communist party of Western Ukraine. So the left was gone. At the center of Ukrainian politics in interwar Poland was a party which proclaimed the need to collaborate, to work with the Polish authorities. So this was a party which was, by, by, by the way, the largest party amongst the Ukrainians of what was then Eastern Poland. Um, they had members of parliament in the parliament in Warsaw, um, and they basically said, we need to work with the Polish state to protect Ukrainian interests. But they were discredited by the Polish state's treatment of the Ukrainian minority, especially in the second half of the 1930s, when Education in, in Ukrainian was made very difficult when Ukrainian Orthodox churches were forcibly um, converted into Roman Catholic churches. So this centrist platform was discredited and destroyed. And the only force that was that remained was the far right, the OUN. Um, and when Hitler um, launched his attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, some leaders of the Ukrainian far-right nationalists hoped that he would create a kind of Ukrainian puppet state that they would lead. Mm. And this was not um, completely unfath uh, unfathomable. What's the word? <laughs> unfathomable. Anyway, it wasn't. It made some sense at the time uh, because um, Hitler did that with Slovakia, for instance. Um, right? He created sort of puppet state of Slovakia after the destruction of Czechoslovakia. But for Hitler, there was no room for even an autonomous Ukrainian entity, not to mention an independent Ukraine of any kind, because for him, Ukraine was where German colonists would move and uh, grow wheat. So the Ukrainian nationalist hopes for that they had placed on Hitler, who, like them, was dissatisfied with the post-Versailles order in Europe. They, these hopes were quickly, quickly disappointed. But um, the Ukrainian far right ordered its members to collaborate with the Germans, to join the German auxiliary police, for instance, because th this gave them access to weapons and military training. And then from around 1943 onwards, the Ukrainian nationalists um, left the German forces and began to fight a sort of partisan war against both the Germans and the Soviets committing um, ethnic cleansing campaigns uh, against the Polish population. Before that, they had played quite an active role as local collaborators in the Holocaust. And when the Soviet army arrived uh, into Ukrainian territories, the Ukrainian insurgent army resisted the Soviet army all the way into the early 1950s. It took the Soviets quite a long time to crack down on Ukrainian far-right resistance to the establishment of Soviet power or the re-establishment of Soviet power in Ukraine. Mm. It, it so this Stepan Bandera was the leader, if I remember correctly. Stepan Bandera was the leader of the uh, of the movement in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, but he spent World War II in, in, in German uh, internment. Um, so at the time when the Ukrainian insert, when the Ukrainian nationalists joined the Germans in um, Holocaust campaigns or when they went into the forests and murdered the local Polish population in Volhynia, for instance, Bandera was in German captivity, basically. So he wasn't leading them at the time, but he was a kind of ideological father of the movement, let's say. You and know. he's still viewed as that father today by some parts of the far right, isn't he? 
he is um, not just by the far right now because he has become such a mythical figure in many ways yeah. that he is uh, remembered as a um, prime example of Ukrainian resistance to Sovietization, to Stalinist rule. Um, and people carrying portraits of Bandera in Ukraine or using um, the slogan of the Ukrainian far-right underground Slava Ukraini, they don't necessarily share the far-right vision of the world of the of the OUN. Um, these these symbols, Bandera himself, or the, 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 the phrases used by the Ukrainian insurgent army, they have been in a way stripped of their original meaning from the 1940s, and they're associated more narrowly with Ukrainian resistance to um, Stalinism. Which is not to say this is unproblematic. I mean, the, this kind of treatment of um, far-right symbolism makes it quite difficult to engage in meaningful debate about the legacies or threats of far-right ideologies. Um, they are, and I need to I need to emphasize two things here. First of all, I'm I'm talking about the OUN UPA at some length not to emphasize that Ukrainians are in line with Putin's narrative fascists, not at all. I'm actually trying to place the history of that movement in its context. Mm -hmm. This was a party and a, and a military movement which emerged in the 1940s under the conditions, well, in the 1930s and then really sort of flourished in the 1940s under German occupation. It was a fairly limited movement. We're not talking about millions of people. We are talking about a, a group of, a sort of well-defined group of activists who were able to dominate Ukrainian politics because the left and the centrist act, uh, alternatives had been destroyed by Stalin and by Poland, respectively. Um, and they were able to flourish because Hitler occupied those territories. Um, that's one thing I want to say. Secondly, I do want I, I want to emphasize that the far right in Ukraine today is a fairly minor force in compa in comparison to the far right in France or Germany. Even their electoral performance is abysmal. It's they, they get very few votes. Despite this poor electoral performance, they played a disproportionate role in Ukraine especially in 2014, 2015, when the regular Ukrainian army was unable to defend the country against the Russian invasion. And it was the far right that provided the only, or one of the very few um, well-organized military forces capable of putting up a fight. But now they have once again been marginalized by the fact that the Ukrainian army is not only functional, but actually quite successful, quite remarkably successful. So the, the far right is not an immediate threat in Ukraine today, but I think it's still important to talk about its history and the ways in which it can gain influence beyond the levels of popular support. And the sort of veneration of Bandera or the, the turning of Bandera and the OUN into these much larger symbols of resistance devoid of any ideological implications left or right um, is problematic because there there is very little room for meaningful debate about what the far right actually was where it came from and what role it can play <clears throat> one of the legacies of World War II is that the Ukrainian far right which was able to gain disproportionate influence beyond levels of popular support for far-right ideologies in Ukraine, was able to get that influence because of the German occupation of, of Ukraine. And the memory of Ukrainian far-right today is mobilized, is politicized by Putin to label any kind of resistance to Russian ambitions to control Ukraine as fascism. Yeah, it's certainly been his keyword of the last or few months, mm -hmm. several years now, really. Yes, so, yeah. yes. I've mentioned that the Soviet state hijacked Ukrainian national identity for its own purposes. And the most 
well-known example of resistance to that is the far right, but actually much more sustained and much more consequential was um, a different kind of Ukrainian national activism, which slowly but surely in the second half of the 20th century undermined um, Soviet attempts to portray Ukrainians as Russians' younger brothers. The Modern Insurgent is completely independent. If you want to support our work and help boost independent journalism, please consider supporting us via Patreon at patreon.com slash moderninsurgent. Thank you very much. It looks like even more development. It looks like it's pretty much been confirmed that he's dead. Is it more surprising that he's dead or that he has lived this long since June? I wonder. Uh... And it ties in perfectly with what we were just speaking about as well. What's Putin doing right now? He's speaking at the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Kursk. Of course, of course <laughs> he is. I mean, the, you know, the Great Patriotic War. I don't like that term. Let's say the Second World War mm. was a very brutal, traumatic experience for Soviet citizens. There is no doubt about that. But the way that its memory has been politicized and hijacked to support an expansionist, aggressive foreign policy and a repressive policy at home is just disgusting. It's it's just... <sighs> The fact that the Stalinist state played quite an important role in maximizing people's suffering in the Soviet Union during World War II, not, not only by misplaced alliances in 1939, but also by using Soviet soldiers as cannon fodder, that is omitted, that the human dimension of the war is omitted. And instead, the, war, the mem memory of World War II is used to sustain a cult of a strong, centralized, authoritarian state. Um, it's a very damaging myth. Yeah. And yeah, I completely... It's, uh, it's abhorrent how it's been twisted. Like, incredibly admirable things were done in the fight against fascism, and they've been co-opted by fascists. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I spoke at some length about the far right, maybe longer than I had intended to. And I'm not sure if there's enough sound bites in there for you to get much out of it. Um, but what I wanted to really, what I wanted to emphasize is that a more widespread and much more long-lasting challenge to Soviet attempts at shaping Ukrainian identities came not from the far right but rather from within the Soviet system. Especially after the death of Stalin, many Ukrainian intellectuals and also activists of the Communist Party of Ukraine, this theoretically autonomous part of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, tested the limits of permissible national expression without rejecting the Soviet system as such. For example, in Kiev in the early 1960s, young poets, young artists promoted Ukrainian language and culture through official Soviet institutions like the Communist Youth League or universities or the Union of Writers. And they claimed that in promoting the use of Ukrainian language and reviving aspects of Ukrainian culture, which had been crushed under Stalin, they claimed that they were reviving early Soviet Leninist nationalities policy. And their promotion of Ukrainian culture was closely associated with attempts at exposing the excesses and the legacies of Stalinist rule. Post-Stalinist intellectuals in Ukraine were some of the most vocal proponents of relaxing censorship, upholding the rule of law, fighting poverty, and resisting state repression of dissidents. And they were able to operate legally in the 1960s, but with the advent of the Brezhnev period, when there was much less room for cultural and political plurality compared to the Khrushchev period, um, many of these Ukrainian intellectuals sustained a vibrant dissident movement um, in Ukraine, uh, which used a sort of national platform uh, 
to protest against abuses of human rights, against enforced russification of Ukraine, etc. So it wasn't the far right in the second half of the 20th century that informed um, Ukrainian attempts to resist these kind of crude state-sponsored narratives of what it meant to be Ukrainian. It was people who came from within the Soviet system and pushed it, pushed its, pushed its limits. It was also Ukraine's proximity to the USSR's western border, which effectively undermines uh, Moscow's attempts to co-opt Ukrainian identities in a way that supported this myth of eternal, supposedly eternal friendship between East Slavs. Ukrainian intellectuals, um, partly because actually maybe what I should say first is that the establishment, the establishment of Soviet hegemony in Eastern Europe at the end of World War II is really important for understanding this process. Um, countries like Czechoslovakia, Romania, Poland uh, were part of the socialist camp. They were Soviet satellite states, but they were not um, part of the USSR itself. And from the Soviet perspective, they were they were they, they were a kind of near abroad. They were um, much more accessible than the capitalist West. Travel from the USSR to Czechoslovakia was much easier than travel to Western Europe. Um, it wasn't easy, but it was easier. Um, these countries had political and economic systems which were closely modeled on the Soviet type of socialism. But at the same time, they were unambiguously foreign. They were unambiguously, unambiguously non-Soviet. Um, the Russian language was not nearly as widely spoken in the Soviet satellite states as it was in the USSR itself. Um, Poland, for example, did not collectivize most of its agriculture. So their economic systems differed from the Soviet prototype. Um, most importantly, perhaps, the Soviet satellite states faced the kinds of political movements, opposition movements, um, on a scale that was unseen in the Soviet Union itself. The Hungarian uprising of 1956, the Prague Spring of 1968, an attempt to create socialism with the human face, the Solidarity Movement in Poland in the 1980s, which had some 10 million members, are prime examples of how in the Soviet satellite states there was more room for political and cultural plurality. Mm. And Ukraine was very exposed to developments across its western border. Um, Ukrainian intellectuals, for, instance, for example, forged ties with Czechoslovak intellectuals or Polish intellectuals as part of an attempt to create this socialist commonwealth uh, in the Soviet bloc. But these ties often worked in ways that Moscow did not control. For instance, um, a Ukrainian poet by the name of Lina Kostenko was very active on the Ukrainian cultural scene in the 1960s during the thaw. Uh, she was part of the 60 years movement of Ukrainian intellectuals who pushed the limits of permissible expression. Um, but later, her work was censored in Soviet Ukraine under Brezhnev, but she continued to publish her poetry in Poland, in magazines that were then imported back into the Soviet Union, into Soviet Ukraine specifically. During the Prague Spring of 1968, inhabitants of Ukraine knew more about what was happening in Czechoslovakia than people who lived further east in the Soviet Union. Uh, they could watch Czechoslovak television. They could listen to Czechoslovak radio broadcasts, some of which were in the Ukrainian language, because there is a Ukrainian minority in Eastern Slovakia, which had its own radio broadcasts. And this helped expose inhabitants of Soviet Ukraine to ideas which were unacceptable in the Soviet Union itself. For instance, in, in, in Eastern Slovakia, the Ukrainians legalized the so-called Greek Catholic Church or the Union Church, which was first created in the late 1500s. It was a church that 
maintained an orthodox ritual, but recognized the authority of the Pope in Rome. And this church existed in Western Ukraine. Um, under Stalin, this church was forced underground, but it was legalized in Eastern Slovakia amongst the Ukrainian communities in Eastern Slovakia. But the Ukrainians in Soviet Ukraine knew about it. And they began to say that perhaps that church could be um, decriminalized in the Soviet Union itself. The fact that um, Hungarians um, had a much easier access to various consumer goods that were difficult to buy in the Soviet Union itself raised troubling questions in Soviet Ukraine about the nature of the system in which they lived, with the Hungarians' right to introduce the so-called new economic mechanism, and should Soviet Ukraine follow suit. Mm. When the Poles created the Solidarity Movement, that also raised troubling questions about not only the USSR's foreign policy, right, is the, USS, is the USSR's control over Poland stable, but it also raised troubling questions about the nature of the system in which the Ukrainians themselves lived. And Ukrainians, especially in Western Ukraine, were very aware of what was going on just across their Western border. I'm not trying to say that all Ukrainians who observed and reacted to major crises in socialist Eastern Europe suddenly turned anti-Soviet, not at all. What I am trying to say is that the proximity of the border exposed the unstable nature of the Soviet system, and it exposed the constructed nature of borders and ethnic identities. The USSR relied on this primordial essentialist idea that nations were just fixed entities. And it tried to say, well, now, you know, all the Slavs, not just the Eastern Slavs, not just the Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, but also the Poles and the Czechs, we live together in harmony, in friendship. And those evil Germans are just waiting to get back at us. Um, but when the Czechs or the Poles questioned Soviet hegemony, that exposed the very constructed nature of these supposedly natural ethnic affinities. So I think Ukraine was in a unique position in the Soviet Union, along with Belarus and Lithuania, uh, in that um, people began to talk about politics, people began to talk about identity. Um, and that in itself was destabilizing uh, for the Soviet system. And the final thing I'm going to say on this is that when the USSR began to unravel, when the depths of the economic crisis became visible under Gorbachev, when Moscow's central controls were increasingly questioned, and when corruption and nepotism spread throughout Soviet institutions, the fact that Ukraine had its own Communist Party, the fact that Ukraine had its own capital city and its own government, however powerless these bodies were in the USSR, it mattered now. Because various intellectuals, various political leaders in Ukraine could turn around and say, if you give us more power, if Ukraine becomes autonomous, or if Ukraine becomes independent, we can fix the problems that have accumulated in the USSR. They could blame Moscow for everything that had gone wrong, rightly or wrongly, and they could mobilize Ukrainian institutions and Ukrainian identities um, to channel the frustration that people had with poor quality of life and abuses of power in the Soviet Union. As a result of which, in, 19, um, in, the, in the 1990s, support for Ukrainian independence uh, was strong throughout Ukraine, not just in the Ukrainian-speaking West, but also in the Russian-speaking Donetsk region. And I don't use the word Donbas because that in itself is an imperial construct, but I won't go into it. Um, and in the, in the independence referendum, uh, people th throughout Ukraine voted uh, in support of Ukrainian independence because they saw Ukrainian institutions as a more promising um, they, they saw Ukrainian institutions as more promising um, than the now widely discredited central Soviet power. Mm -hmm. um, my final question for our incredible, incredible podcast episode today.
so we've gone through the Russification of Ukraine in the 30s, which was consolidated by World War II, and the cracks have started to appear throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s from the transfer of information through the border. 1991, when mm -hmm. shit hits the fan, what does yeah. that do to the Ukrainian identity? Is it is it the seal is released and it starts to flow, or is it a drip feed? Mm -hmm. It's a drip feed. <clears throat> it's a drip feed because um, for much of the 1990s, we have basically elite continuity from the Soviet period. So, okay. So the transformation of Ukrainian identity was slow in the 1990s. And I think this is largely because of elite continuity from before 1991. Uh, the first president of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk, had been in charge of propaganda in the Communist Party of Ukraine Central Committee in the early 1980s. He, in the early 80s, had spoken Russian and he had sung praises of the supposedly eternal Russo-Ukrainian friendship. It's only in the um, late 80s, early 90s that he changes tune, changes language, changes his ideological outlook, his mental geography, so to speak. And um, the legacies of Soviet attempts to define Ukrainian identities in a way that supported continuing Russian domination of the country was strong. And it's really only in the early 2000s that we see a mass mobilization of civil society who use Ukrainian identity to protest against abuses of power and attempt specifically to falsify election uh, results in the 2004 Orange Revolution. And it, this is an example of a new generation coming to um, sort of gaining a voice, a new generation gaining a voice and mobilizing at first, not in any kind of anti-Russian way. They mobilize against post-Soviet legacies, against post-Soviet um, abuses of power, uh, corruption, and authoritarianism. But because Russia sees that as a threat, because Russia sees the mobilization of civil society as a threat, they continue to meddle in Ukrainian internal politics, which of course culminates in the uh, occupation of Crimea and the invasion of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions in 2014. And Russia sees this as a threat partly because it doesn't know where it's going to lead. Uh, it doesn't know um, whether it's going to be able to control new political forces that are emerging in Ukraine in the way that it had been able to control the post-Soviet generation. Um, also, perhaps Russia is afraid that Ukrainian ideas might spill over the border into Russia itself and create a kind of Maidan in Moscow. But the effect of that meddling and the effect of Russian attempts to crack down on Ukrainian civil society activism is that it turns anti-Russian. And... Um, it becomes um, Ukrainian fight for democracy becomes intertwined with the Ukrainian fight against Russia. And I think that is a slow process which requires a, which required a generational change which um, was solidified by the aggression of 2014 mm. and which has now I hesitate to say this because it's difficult to do any meaningful research on this at the moment but i think we see a real sway against russia in ukraine amongst the majority of the population in 2014 i remember i was i was in kiev i was trying to fall asleep in my apartment and i could hear neighbors arguing again across the wall and i could gather from the conversation that it was a an elderly woman a middle-aged woman and a child. Um, and the elderly woman was clearly um, anti-Maidan, anti the Euromaidan revolution, saying Putin is our friend, the West will betray us, the West will turn us into slaves, um, and Russians are our friends. 
And the middle-aged woman was shouting, saying, you're so naive. Um, he's already occupied Crimea. Um,